Gentlemen, welcome to Excel's Energy's year-end 2020 earnings conference call. Today's conference is being recorded. Questions will be taken from invest institutional, excuse me, questions will be taken from institutional investors. Reporters can conduct contact media relations with inquirers and individual investors and others can reach out to investor relations. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Paul Johnson, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good morning, and welcome to Excel Energy's 2020 year-end conference call. Joining me today are Ben Folk, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Bob Frenzel, President and Chief Operating Officer, Brian Van Abel, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and Amanda Rome, Executive Vice President and General Counsel. This morning, we'll re review our 2020 results and share recent business and regulatory developments. Slides that accompany today's call are available on our website. As a reminder, some of the comments during today's call may contain forward-looking information. Significant factors that could cause results to differ from those anticipated are described in our earnings release and our SEC filings. Today, we will discuss certain metrics that are non-GAAP measures, including ongoing earnings and electric and natural gas margins. Information on the comparable GAAP measures and re reconciliations are included in the earnings release. I'm going to go off script for a section, which is a little bit dangerous, but in December, Utility that I've recognized Ben Folk as Utility Executive of the Year for his environmental leadership. You know, Ben was the architect of our Steel for Fuel strategy to Excel. He's also the one that drove us to be the first utility to declare that we were going to have an objective 100% carbon free by 2050. This is a well deserved and overdue um, award. With that, I'll turn it over to Ben. Oh, well, Paul, I'm blessing you. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, that old saying, never get off the boat, Paul, never, never get off the boat. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what that means, but I'll just take it. That's from Apocalypse now. Um, anyway, okay. All right. So I'm not going to go off script, and I'm going to thank everybody and welcome you to our call. Um, you know, last year was certainly a challenging year, but our employees came through delivering on our financial and operational objectives while mitigating the impacts of COVID and helping our communities. Overall, 2020 was truly a stellar year. We executed on our business continuity plans as we kept employees and customers safe while providing reliable customer service. We're helping to jumpstart the economy through our capital investment programs, which create jobs and investment in our communities. And we stepped up our commitment to charitable giving to support those in need, including donating the gain of almost $20 million from our sale of the Mankato facility. We had a long and impressive list of accomplishments in 2020. Let me share a few of them. We delivered EPS of 279 in 2020, which is the 16th consecutive year of meeting or exceeding our earnings guidance. We raised our annual dividend by 10 cents per share, which is the 17th straight year we've increased our dividend. And we achieved a total shareholder return of just over 7.8%, which was the second highest TSR for our peer group. Our O&M declined almost 1%, as we took actions to mitigate the impacts of COVID. The Minnesota Commission approved our wind repowering proposal and our request to acquire the Mauer wind farm. And finally, we resolved multiple rate cases during the pandemic. Now turning to our investment plans, the Minnesota Commission recently approved our 650 megawatt wind repowering proposal with 750 million of rate base investment. The wind portfolio is projected to provide customer savings of more than $160 million over the life of the assets. It'll create jobs, jumpstart the economy, and reduce carbon. In addition, we're also proposing to acquire a repowered 120 megawatt wind farm PPA buyout for about $210 million. Now this project was initially submitted as part of the Minnesota Relief and Recovery RFP but the repowering didn't result in customer savings. However, we've worked with the party on the terms and the project is now expected to provide customer savings over the life of the asset, so we'll move forward with it. We also plan to file our Minnesota solar proposal later in the quarter. This project consists of 460 megawatts of solar facilities near our retiring Sherco coal plant, which takes advantage of existing transmission. We fine-tuned our projections and now expect an estimated investment of $550 million. This lower cost provides more benefit to our customers. We have requested a commission decision on both projects 
in the third quarter and are confident the commission will see the consumer benefit. As part of our strategy to lead the clean energy transition, we're also working to electrify the transport sector. In 2020, we announced the goal to enable 1.5 million electric vehicles in our service territory by 2030. We have programs and filings underway in various states and our transportation electrification plan in Colorado was just recently approved. And we continue to achieve important milestones in our nation leading wind expansion program with the completion of six projects in 2020. These projects represent nearly 1500 megawatts of capacity and were completed under budget. In addition, we have approximately 800 megawatts of wind projects under construction, <coughs> excuse me, which are expected to be completed in 2021. We're excited to continue the clean energy transition, which will result in significant customer savings and carbon reductions. We also had a strong year operationally. For example, our nuclear team continues to make great strides in transforming performance while reducing cost. The fleet achieved a capacity factor of over 96% in 2020, even with a refueling outage during COVID. We have one of the top performing nuclear fleets in the country as rated by both the NRC and INCO. And in addition to strong performance, we have continued to lower our cost structure with O&M costs declining by more than 5% in 2020. And this is the sixth straight year of declining O&M costs in our nuclear operations. So I'm extremely proud of the effort and the results of our nuclear employees and their leadership in our industry. <clears throat> Beyond our strong financial and operational performance, I'm also very proud of our ESG leadership. In 2020, we estimate that we reduced carbon emissions by about 50% from 2005 levels, and we remain on track to achieve an 80% carbon reduction by 2030. We announced our plans to convert the Harrington coal plant in Texas to natural gas by the end of 2024. Working with our co-owners, we announced a, the proposed early retirement of the Craig and Hayden coal plants in Colorado. We will address the remaining coal plants in Colorado in our resource plan filing at the end of March. We're also making significant strides to improve ESG compliance, transparency, and disclosure as we issued our TCFD risk assessment, our natural gas report on our plans to reduce greenhouse gases in our LDC, and our green bond impact report. We earned another perfect score on the Human Rights Campaign's Corporate Equality Index and remain among the best places to work for LGBTQ equality. All of this adds up to an outstanding ESG record, which is integrated into our strategy and increasingly important to investors. I'm really pleased with our accomplishments and looking forward, I'm excited about the opportunities we have in 2021 and beyond. With that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Thanks, Ben, and good morning, everyone. We had another strong year, booking $2.79 per share for 2020, compared with $2.64 per share last year. The most significant earnings drivers for the year include the following. Higher electric margins increased earnings by $0.32 cents per share, primarily driven by riders and rate outcomes. Higher AFUDC increased earnings by $0.08 cents per share due to large projects under construction, including our wind generation. Lower O&M expenses increased earnings by $0.02 cents per share, driven by our cost management efforts. And finally, a lower effective tax rate increased earnings by $0.22 cents per share. As a reminder, production tax credits lower the ETR. However, PTCs are flowed back to customers who, through lower electric margin are largely earnings neutral. Offsetting these positive drivers were increased depreciation and interest expense, which reduced earnings by $0.36 cents per share, reflecting our capital investment program. Other taxes, primarily property taxes, reduce earnings by $0.06 cents per share. And finally, other items combined to reduce earnings by $0.07 cents per share. Turning to, turning to sales, as expected, COVID had an adverse impact as weather and leap year adjusted electric sales declined by about 3%. For 2021, we don't anticipate a full shutdown of the economy like we experienced last spring. Instead, we expect a slow recovery with lingering impacts throughout the year. As a result, we anticipate modest weather-adjusted sales growth of approximately 1% off of depressed 2020 sales levels. As a reminder, we have a sales throughout mechanism for all electric classes in Minnesota and decoupling for the electric residential 
and non-demand small CNI classes in Colorado. This covers about 45% of our total retail electric sales. Shifting to expenses, we showed strong cost management by reducing O&M nearly 1% to mitigate the adverse, imp adverse COVID impacts. We expect the O&M expenses to be relatively flat in 2021, reflecting incremental costs for our new wind farms offset by a decline in base O&M. Next, let me provide a quick regulatory update. In December, the Minnesota Commission approved our 2021 sale proposal as an alternative to our filed rate case. We view this as a constructive outcome that will allow us to focus on the Minnesota Resource Plan and other policy initiatives in 2021. In January, we filed a New Mexico rate case seeking a rate increase of approximately $88 million or a net rate increase of $48 million after reflecting the fuel savings and PTCs from the Sagamore Wind Farm. The net increase is driven by investment in transmission and distribution due to the significant growth in New Mexico since the last case. The request is based on an ROE of 10.35%, an equity ratio of 54.7%, a retail rate base of $1.9 billion, and a historic test year. It also includes changes in depreciation to reflect the planned early retirement of our total coal plant. The decision and implementation of final rates is anticipated in the fourth quarter of this year. We also plan to file a Texas rate case later in the quarter. Both cases were re required as a part of the approval of our wind projects at SPS. In November 2020, we filed a request in North Dakota seeking an electric rate increase of approximately $22 million. This is our first rate case in North Dakota in eight years. The request is based on an ROE of 10.2%, an equity ratio of 52.5%, a rate base of $677 million, and a forecast test year. Interim rates were implemented in January and the decision is expected later this year. And in February, we will file a transmission expansion plan in Colorado to increase capacity to enable the addition of renewables to the system. We will also file a resource plan in Colorado at the end of March. It will include proposed plans for remaining coal plants in the state as well as additional renewable resources as we work to reduce carbon emissions at least 80% by 2030. The transmission expansion and resource plan will provide transparency into our long-term opportunities and will likely lead to robust capital investment in the second half of the decade. We expect the decisions on both the transmission expansion and the resource plan by early 2022. As Ben mentioned, the Minnesota Commission approved our wind repowering proposal. As a result, we're moving these wind projects into our base capital forecast, which now reflects rate-based growth of 6.6%. We also have potential incremental capex of approximately $210 million for the PPA buyout and $550 million for the Shirko Solar Facility. If approved, rate-based growth would be 6.9%. Accordingly, we have updated our capital tables and our financing plans as detailed in our earnings release. We anticipate that the incremental capital, if approved by the Minnesota Commission, would be financed with approximately 50% equity and 50% debt. This incremental equity will allow us to fund accretive capital investments, which will benefit our customers while maintaining our solid credit metrics and favorable access to the capital markets. And with that, I'll wrap up with a quick summary. We continue to provide reliable service to our customers while ensuring the safety and well-being of our employees and communities. We effectively mitigated COVID impacts and delivered earnings within our original guidance range for the 16th consecutive year. We increased our dividend for the 17th consecutive year we continue to execute on our steel for fuel strategy by adding nearly 1,500 megawatts of owned wind in 2020. The Minnesota Commission approved our wind repowering proposal and the acquisition of the Maurer Wind Farm, both of which will provide significant benefits to our customers. The Colorado Commission approved our transportation electrification plan. We enhanced our ESG disclosures and made further progress to reduce coal exposure and deliver on our carbon reduction goals. We resolved multiple regulatory proceedings We've reaffirmed our 2021 earnings guidance of $2.90 per share to $3 per share. And finally, we remain confident we can deliver long-term earnings and dividend growth within our five to seven cent objective range. With that, that concludes our remarks and operator will now take questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star one on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speaker phone, please make sure the mute function on your phone is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Again, please press star 1 to ask a question. We'll pause for a moment to allow everyone an opportunity to signal for questions.
We'll take our first question from Jer Jeremy Tonit with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Good morning, Jeremy. Just want to start off with um, what you could say about what type of capital opportunities are you seeing um, associated with the Colorado IRP? And I was just wondering if you could frame the magnitude of what incremental spend might look like versus your current plan. So, hey, Jeremy, good morning. So, uh, two parts to, to that is really the, the Colorado Transmission Expansion Plan. And if, you, if you've heard about us talk before about transmission, we see a, a lot of opportunities um, to really this is needed to enable uh, our energy transition. Right? Uh, we need to enable several gigawatts of renewables. And if you think about that, it's enabling low-cost universal-scale solar and wind uh, to bring it to our load centers in Denver. So what you'll see out of that, and now I can't give you specifics in terms of the overall capital investment. We'll file that in the next month or so. But significant investment opportunity on the transmission side, it's really a transmission backbone uh, to deliver that for our customers as part of the ERP. On the Colorado Resource Plan, I think you know more detail to come on that. But look at our Minnesota Resource Plan as a good proxy, uh, where we have several gigawatts of renewables in our preferred plan uh, through 2030. So it'll look and feel a lot like that. Where looking at what we're doing with our coal plants and adding a lot of renewables to help us achieve that 80% plan. So um, we're excited about it. Uh, excited for that transparency into the back half of this decade, uh, and more details to come. That's helpful. Thank you. I um, was just wondering if you might be able to comment on how the PPA bio opportunity set has evolved over the past uh, year or so during the pandemic. And do you expect any market changes going forward here? You know, I think, you know, it's it has evolved a little bit. And you see we just announced one here. Um, generic will provide more details and, and officially announce that in the next month or so as, as we file it. Uh, you know, we're excited to continue to execute on it. We delivered the Mauer PPA buyout this year with the commission and this one. I know we continue to have conversations with our counterparties. Uh, I think there's another opportunity if you see potential tax credit extensions um, in Washington that you get some repo further repowering opportunities. But it's something that we continually, we continually look at and work on with our counterparties. There's a, another good data point to watch is that our IRPs often drive RFPs where we can have PPAs bid into us, you know, PPA buyout opportunities. So that's a really good opportunity longer term. So while we're excited about it, we've delivered, if you look what we've delivered on our PPA buyout opportunity, we've counting this one that we just announced, it's over $500 million of, of PPA buyouts, and that's excluding Mankato. So we've delivered Mauer, Long Road, this new one, Tepco, and Manchief and Belmont. So, you know, a good long-term opportunity as we continue to look at harvesting it. Yeah, and I think just, you know, whether it's PPAs, whether it's transmission spend, whether it's renewables, um, you should feel very confident that we've got a long runway of capital investment, and that's what uh, we're really excited about. And, of course, you know, we've been focused on renewables that actually save customers money, too, so that this clean energy transition can be driven by economics, which, of course, then sets up the electrification of other sectors like transport. So um, I think we've got great uh, organic growth uh, in front of us, Jeremy. Got it. That's very helpful. Thanks. And one last one, if I could sneak in here. Just wondering, what do you guys see as the risks and opportunities with the potential acceleration of Minnesota's carbon-free electricity goal to 2040 here? And, and also thinking about on a national level, um, you know, Biden has set out plans for 2035 there, and just wondering if you had any thoughts you could share. Thanks. Well, I mean, first of all, I'm <clears throat> pretty pleased that, you know, Excel and our whole industry now is really uh, on board with, you know, achieving uh, net zero goals. And, you know, for us, uh, it's it, we think we can do uh, zero carbon, not net zero, but zero carbon by 2050 with an important interim goal of 80% by 2030. But, you know, if you heard me talk before, I will tell you that that last 20% is going to take uh, technologies to become commercially viable because 
Uh, Jeremy, I think it's incredibly important that this transition is based on economics so that you do have the opportunities to electrify other sectors with economics in mind. You get a lot of bipartisan support when economics can drive the decisions. <clears throat> so could we go faster than our goal of 2050? Well, it's possible. I mean, but I think that would mean that those technologies that we refer to, whether it's the next generation nuclear, whether it's the development of hydrogen, whether it's carbon capture working economically, whether it's you know uh, long-term storage, they have to they have to come into the money much sooner than I than I think they will. But uh, right, you've heard me say before, I never bet against technology. Um, so more to come on that. Got it. Appreciate the thoughts there. That's it for me. Thanks. We'll take our next question from Julian Julian Smith with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, team. Uh, thanks for the time. Um, so just wanted to follow up on, on Colorado and, and latest thought process on uh, timing for a rate case there. I, um, in conjunction with the question, I'm just curious about the shift in your 21 guide on, on O&M. Is that driven in part by a thought process on, on Colorado rate case timing? Or I, I also noticed that there's a little bit of a shift in um, the rider revenues there as well. So if you could speak to the 21 shift on O&M, as well as uh, the latest on, on Colorado and, and timing there as well, if you don't mind. Hey, Julian, it's Bob. Good morning, um, and thanks for the question. Uh, with regard to the case, I'll cover that, and I'll turn it back over to Brian to talk a little bit about your question on the O&M. Um, uh, so in, in Colorado, obviously, uh, we've been talking about a, a case there. Uh, our, we, we filed two riders in the summer of last year. Um, obviously, we watched what happened with the Aegis rider. We're still prosecuting the wildfire rider. But there's a number of other factors that, that go into evaluation of our case in Colorado, and we're continuing to watch those. Obviously, the pace of economic recovery uh, in Colorado is, is very important. We're seeing very strong growth there. Um, but as Brian indicated, uh, our, our sales forecast still expects a slow recovery with some lingering impacts. So sales is a key driver, and obviously our efforts around O&M and, and efficiencies that we can gain in that business will, will probably dictate uh, when and how we file a case in Colorado. Um, you know, it's likely a, a second half outcome at the earliest, um, and, and it's largely associated with, with capital investment in, in the distribution business uh, and in uh, enabling technologies for us to continue to deliver uh, a great customer experience out there. So more to come from us, but it, it's probably at least a second half decision for us. And good morning, Julian. Uh, on your O&M on your question, uh, first, just let me say, uh, really proud of the employees and the work that was done in 2020. Uh, just a, a great effort in terms of the mitigation work that uh, that everyone did in this company. Um, about 2021, it's a combination of things. One is, you know, we're continuing to drive sustainable cost transformation. And two, our, our 2020 actuals came in a little bit higher than we thought in Q3 due, due to a couple of discrete items. So, um, but expect us to continue to drive O&M transformation. Now, what you don't see in our flat guidance is we're adding about $50 million of wind O&M in 2021. So we're offsetting that to keep our overall overall O&M flat with our cost transformation efforts. So excited about what we accomplished in 2020 and what we expect to accomplish in 21 and beyond. Excellent. Thanks, team. Hey, Bob, coming back to you real quickly, if I can. Um, in terms of when you said that there are, uh, to quote you, a number of other factors here that go into it, um, I think if I'm hearing you right, the, perhaps the most decisive one is obviously the sales and economic growth. Are there other material drivers that, 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 that will come into it? It's, it's, it sounds like you're just waiting to see the trajectory of this post-COVID year um, on sales, but I, just, I, I don't want to sort of mischaracterize that. You know, look, we still have our, our wildfire rider proposal in front of, of the ALJ right now. We went through hearings uh, a week or two ago and, and felt like we, we made a really good showing there. I mean, this is a significant investment to mitigate a big state policy uh, desire uh, in terms of, of mitigating wildfires. Um, so we'd asked for a rider. Uh, the, the interveners came back proposing deferrals, and we're differing on you know, links and return profiles of those. Uh, so uh, are obviously arguing a decent outcome in the wildfire um, uh, rider is one of the factors that would go into our decision making, but not certainly not exclusive. So Julian probably hits right. the fact that it's sales, it's O&M, um, and then it would be regulatory decisions. All of that would factor into a media kind of review and, and determine whether or not we need to file or not. 
Right. Uh, yeah, understood. If, if you got the deferral, that would that be adequate? It, it sounds like there's more than just a binary decision on the on the uh, the wildfire here. I think you'd have to just look at how the you know the devil's always in the details on those things. So that, along with the the other drivers that I mentioned, sales and L and M, would be all the factors that we looked at. Totally appreciate it. All right, guys. Thank you very much. All the best. Speak to you soon. Yeah, thanks, Julian. We'll take our next question from Insu Kim with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, Brian, on the, the Pfizer CapEx plan, uh, can you just, I guess, go through which of the items um, are in the base plan versus the incremental? I know the you know, the proposed repowering and the one PPA buyout is with the incremental, not in the base, but our investments in the, the Harrington coal plant conversion and, you know, the investments with the wildfire protection, all of those, are, is that embedded in the base plan or would that be incremental? Yeah, no, those are the ones that you mentioned are, are basically in the, the base plan. And it's a relatively small investment in the, in the Harrington and in, in the, the conversion of Harrington from coal to natural gas. And we do have our, our wildfire wildfire investments um, in, in our base plan. Uh, you're right. You know, you know, clear that we have the solar opportunity and the PPA bond opportunity in, in the incremental plan, and hope to and expect to get visibility into those by the end of this year. So we can, you know, provide color and, and hopefully have a rate-based growth trajectory of, of nearly seven percent if we execute on those. Got it. Um, and then just going back to Jeremy's question on, you know, President Biden's plan to. Um, achieve the carbon as pollution free power sector in the US by 2035. And setting aside for a moment the probability of passing packing your federal or state policies to achieve that, do you think when you look at your fleet, um, the undepreciated value of your remaining coal plants or other um, fossil fuel fossil fuel units, how do you see that? Do you see that as potentially achievable uh, given you know the current regulatory and you know uh, price framework for renewables or what Items do you think you're, you would need on both ends to to achieve that? Well, you know, you, the, the the accelerated depreciation is, is is certainly a factor. But as I said uh, with the prior um, question, it's far more a question of are the technologies ready, ready and economically viable? Um, because you know. Uh, you know, getting to 80% is, is not easy, but we know we can do it with existing technology, and I know I can do it in a way that preserves affordability and reliability, but, you know, just to uh, move completely away from fossil will, would require an incredible emergence and acceleration of technologies that I think are still um, a ways away. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, again, it, technology can emerge, but you know, 2035 is like tomorrow in utility land as far as technologies go. So, you know, I, I think there's going to be. I mean, I, I think there's going to be an element of, of, of pragmatism that that gets baked into those um, goals. And um, I've always said, you know, we'll, we'll move as fast as the speed of technology, uh, and that's what we'll do. But honestly, I think it's it's a it's a, a very much of a stretch goal based upon the way I see the horizon in front of them. So that said, Got it. I mean, you know, that said, I mean, but there's a lot of good things that come with that goal. We support 100% carbon free. So we're aligned with that. Uh, I think under the Biden administration, you'll see an acceleration of uh, EVs and, uh, you know, an acceleration of transmission build. Uh, I think you'll see an acceleration of the R&D and the technologies that we need to achieve those goals, whether it's 2035, 2040, or 2050. And I think, you know, that, that is the key to me. And if we can all pull together on that and, you know, develop the right frameworks, invest in R&D, have the right tax policies, I think, I think we're going to do amazing things. And, you know, nobody would have thought that we'd be where we are today as an industry and certainly not at Excel Energy just five years ago. So um, I'm excited about what the future possibilities hold. Got it. Thank you so much for the call. Got it. We'll take our next question from Stephen Baird with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Hey. Hope you all are doing well. We are. 
Great. Uh, just following up on, uh, you can sense the theme in the questions here on uh, on federal policy, but I wanted to maybe get a little more more specific. You know, we may see further legislation that would both extend tax credits for wind and solar, uh, potentially create a new tax credit for storage. And I'm just curious if you saw that kind of, let's say that there is a longer term extension. Could that be material enough for you all to want to both kind of relook at your Minnesota resource plan? Could that have a pretty big impact on how you think about your resource mix in Colorado? Like how impactful could, you know, longer term extensions for wind and solar and kind of a new tax credit for storage be as you think about your resource mix in the future? Oh, I, well, first of all, I think it overall would be a positive. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, and I think, you know, there's also discussion about, you know, tax uh, credits for nuclear as well, which I am fully supportive of, and transmission. All of those things are going to enable us to go, uh, I think, even faster be, um, uh, because of the affordability uh, equation to it. Um, obviously, at some point, you do saturate the big grid with renewables, regardless of cost. Um, but if renewables continue to fall in price, even what that would allow you to do is put more renewables on your system, even if even if uh, you have uh, an increase in curtailments, because the economics would pencil out better. So that's probably a, a long-winded answer to your question, but um, hopefully that gives you some insights to it. So, and Stephen, I just add that uh, you know, depending on how I certainly delve in details, but depending on how long that that PTC extension is for wind, you start to see more repowering opportunities come up as the wind farms exit their original 10-year um, PTC life. And so that's what you saw with the, the couple of wind farms that we got uh, approved just recently in Minnesota Commission. So I think that could present itself some more opportunities if you had a longer-term extension. Uh, that's a good point. Maybe just following up a little bit on this. So let, let's let's <clears throat> let's dream here, and and let's say that there is going to be you know longer term extension of these tax credits and new storage tax credit, maybe transmission nuclear. Is that enough to sort of trigger a, a kind of a formal review on your part in terms of the the mix that you've sort of established, or is it less less formal and it would just you you continue to evolve your thinking over time, but it wouldn't necessarily sort of trigger a, a reassessment of your broader plans. Well, I mean, uh, I, I think it would. I think it just puts our IRP processes and our proposals that much more deeply in the money for our customers, and it makes the economics that much more compelling. Again, I think yep. we can do more, accelerate some of the renewables that we put into our system within operational limitations. But boy, Stephen, I mean, if, if you've got, uh, if, if, if our electricity because of those things becomes even uh, more affordable. Think about the opportunities to accelerate EV and other uh, electrification of other sectors. I mean, that 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 is a would be a tremendous benefit. That that's a fair point. Maybe just on EVs. Last question for me. I, I promise. Just if we did. Even if you you well, can't hear you. I think he hung up on us. No, I don't think he hung. He's still there. I think. Stephen, did you go on mute by accident? That's one of the most popular terms in 2020, by the way. The other one is, could you go on mute? And the other one is, I forgot my mask. Operator, we'll go to the next question. Okay. We'll take our next question from Sophie Karp with KeyBank. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, good morning, guys. Um, Hope you can hear me. Um, hey, Sophie. Hey, Sophie. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, congrats on a good year in this challenging environment, for sure. Uh, maybe to continue the, with the EV topic, right? Uh, what are the opportunities in the EV advancement, I guess, for you, aside from uh, participating in the charging infrastructure? Have you done mod, some modeling, maybe along the lines of if you know heat penetration in households are just certain levels, there's maybe some upgrades you need to do to the distribution system. Uh, do you know which areas or which states uh, maybe have more need for that? Like how how should we think about that? Because that's that's a really topic that's been uh, on my mind a lot. Thank you. Hey Sophie, it's Bob. Maybe I'll, I'll start this and and then I'll kick it over to Brian potentially. 
Um, you're a little bit muffled, but I think you're asking about what's the investment opportunity if we have a significant penetration of electric vehicles. Um, I think our forecast right now for the next five years has a half a billion dollars in, in electric vehicle, and that includes charging stations and the distribution infrastructure, as you mentioned, to enable that. Uh, and over the decade, that number is closer to one and a half to two billion dollars. Um, similarly, that's all encapsulating into the distribution system. I think the one area that we could probably still sharpen our pencil on a little bit is the impacts of fleet and heavy-duty vehicles and how that would impact us. Those are very discrete and high loads in certain feeders on our system, uh, and we probably aren't as sophisticated as we'd like to be right now on exactly when and where that would happen because it's largely in the hands of, of the owners of those vehicles. Um, so it's possible there's some incremental upside there. You know, our distribution feeders are, I wouldn't say, uh, wildly underutilized at this point, and so potential capital expansion opportunities on fleet and heavy-duty vehicles is probably where any of the upside might come. I think, too, Sophie, <clears throat> there's a virtuous circle here. The more EV penetration we get, particularly if we encourage customers to charge off-peak, the, the more um, all customers benefit, and so that tends to give us, the, you know, that, that – uh, tailwind to keeping our, our product affordable, which makes more electrification, more EVs, everything else more possible. So it's that that element of it is uber exciting. You look way down the road, um, and, you know, there's a lot of folks that think, you know, EV penetrations could be an extension of the grid, if you will, and the use of those batteries. And I was kind of encouraged by the CEO of Ford when he spoke to us at an industry event that you know, he was he he saw that future too because in the past I've been told that uh, you know the, the car manufacturers were a little worried about using batteries in that matter. Now we're a ways away from that, but I mean when you look down the road, you can certainly see a future that uh, um, incorporates EVs into the grid. Got it, got it. This is very helpful. Thank you. And then just on the power supply side, um, as you know, the renewable targeting goals become more aggressive and possibly we will see more build out if like you mentioned we will have additional um, ITC or other fiscal incentives um, is there a scenario where maybe you see uh, a and, you know kind of throwing in their potential core retirement in Colorado is there a scenario where in some of these jurisdictions Colorado specifically or maybe Minnesota you would see a shortage of base load power or like some um, dispatchable capacity, if you will, like what they see maybe in, the, in some other regions in, in that area right now? Or, or do you feel that you have adequate supplies to tie you over to the point where you can have dispatchable renewable resource? I mean, uh, Sophie, let me just make sure I got heard your question because it, it is a little bit muffled. Did you, did you ask if, do you see a uh, situation where because of EV penetration and other things that we might uh, that we might have a shortage of, uh, of uh, dispatchable generation. Dispatchable generation. Yes. Is that your question? Yeah, not not as much, not as much because of EVs, but uh, due to like, higher maybe wind penetration and uh, coal retirements uh, in the region. Um, uh, well, I mean, I, I, that's what the IRP processes are all about. I mean, we do take a long-term view. That's why I do think the vertically integrated regulated model really works because we can plan for those kinds of contingencies and make sure that we do have adequate reserves and adequate backup. Um, you know, the, 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 the point that we have to get across is to hit important interim goals. We do need in the upper Midwest to preserve our nuclear fleet. That's going very well, by the way. And we're going to need a little more gas backup, not necessarily using more gas, but having there, having it ready when some of the renewable resources might not be there. All in all, it still pencils out to be uh, cost beneficial for our customers. But those are the kinds of things we have to discuss in those resource planning processes so that we have a plan, to your point, that provides the economic benefits, the environmental benefits, and, of course, maintains uh, reliability. Thank you so much. I'll jump back into the queue. Thank you, Sophie. We will take our final question from Paul Patterson with Glenrock Associates. Please go ahead. Hey, can you hear me? Hey, Paul, we can hear you loud and clear. We can always hear you. Okay, Paul. awesome. Um, so uh, I wanted to just really quickly, um, I noticed that uh, 
microgrids um, yes, you guys have a microgrid project I think in uh, you filed for something I think in December in, in Wisconsin. I was just wondering what are you seeing or are you seeing any trend in that um, in any other service territories or I mean I realize it's a, it's a pilot and I think it's only around 170 something million but um, just sort of wondering if there's anything um, anything more you're seeing on that end uh, in your service territories. Take it, Bob. Okay. Hey, Paul, it's Bob. Um, look, we filed for some, um, we call them community resiliency initiatives in Colorado um, and worked those through the process with the commission, and we're now got approval, and we're going to start to to build out those initiatives. Um, haven't seen a lot of pull in microgrids um, in the rest of the service territories, but obviously something that we're willing to explore with our customers um, through the process, but, but it's been pretty quiet other than Colorado. Well, microgrids so much. do have a. I think microgrids have a role in in, in utilities' future. It's just you, you know the they don't come without a price tag. So you know the resiliency element of it. The you know the, the those become important things. And you know what we're always willing to do is figure out how we can incorporate that into our total distribution planning process. And and I think you'll see more of that in the future. But. Um, it is not. Uh, it's not without a cost, obviously. So, just to sort of follow up on that, because I guess it varies from from um, territory to territory. Um, I guess to, to within your service territories, I guess the economics just simply aren't there in terms of arbitrage and stuff, in terms of offsetting those costs. Is that how you sort of see it in terms of it being widespread? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that the they work. Primarily, again, when extra resiliency and extra reliability is in order. Right. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you, Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's question and answer session. For closing remarks, I'd like to turn the conference over to Brian Van Abel. Yeah, thank you all for participating in our earnings call this morning. Uh, for any questions, just please contact our investor relations team and have a great day. Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference. We appreciate your participation. You may now disconnect.